And as the ushers come forward and we take the offering, we're going to just go ahead and jump right on into the sermon. Uh, frankly, because I don't want to wait. I'm kind of excited. I'm, I'm glad to be back with you all. As many of you know, last week, the staff and the elders, a lot of us were gone over the weekend at this kind of annual planning retreat that they do. Every year, uh, this group takes some time to get together and really just think and pray and dream about what it is that we feel like God wants to do in us and through us in the year to come. And, and since I'm kind of new around here, this was my first opportunity to be at that. And it was a great experience, and I left just really excited about some of the things that we feel like God is calling us to do. And, and while all the details of, you know, budget and plans and program, all that stuff's still coming together, I think what really got me the most energized was just the fact that we were to come, able to come together and kind of stack hands on some core values some core principles that we as a church are really committed to focusing on this year. And so what I thought we would do for the next few weeks is just take an opportunity to kind of walk through some of these principles and just talk about what they are and why they're important to us. And and I don't think that you guys are going to be surprised by any of these things because these are all things that Suburban has done very, very well over the years. So we're not reinventing the wheel Instead, we're really just trying to think, okay, what does it look like to build on our strengths? If, if it helps, you can think about these different values and priorities almost like lenses that, that we're trying to use to kind of focus in on what, what exactly is God calling us to do this year out of all the things we could do? What are the areas where he's really calling us to focus in our time and our effort and our attention? And like I said, I, I think it's going to be yeah, uh, just sort of a refresher course for many of you, but a quick word to those of you who may be here this morning as our guests. Like, in one sense, you guys pick kind of a strange day to come because it's kind of like insider baseball, right? I mean, we're kind of talking about family matters and, you know, the core values that drive our decisions. And, you know, if we have to pick between A and B, well, these are the lenses that are going to help us make that decision. But, you know, in a real sense, you've picked a great day to come because kind of what we're doing in this series is, in a sense, we're really just kind of pulling back the curtain. And we're trying to talk about the values that drive us, the things that that lead us to do what we do and decide the things that we decide. So if you're here and you're trying to learn more about the God that we follow, this is a great opportunity to do that. Or if you're here and you're trying to figure out, is this a church where you might want to connect? This is a great way to figure out a little bit more about what's at the very heart of what we do. What are the things that, that we really feel like God has uniquely called us to do in this year? And that could be helpful to you, we pray, as you, as you think about what next steps could be. So let me go ahead and just list these out for you. These are the the five ideas that we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. These are, the again, the the core values. If we've got to decide, okay, we can do A or B, how do we know which one is the right choice for us this year? These are the lenses we'll be looking through that help us make those decisions. So we are committed to doing these things, to staying biblically based. Uh, We're committed to being willing to be inconvenienced for the sake of the gospel. We're committed to expressing radical hospitality to people, to serving in our community, and to having healthy relationships with each other. Like I said, none of these are going to be necessarily new for those who've been at Suburban for a long time. These are things that historically we have done well as a church, and we just want to continue to build on those strengths as we step into this next season. And this morning, we're going to spend some time looking at the first one of those, I'm staying biblically based in all that we do. Now, this is not going to come as a surprise to anybody, right? We're a church, so it's not going to be a big shocker when I say, you know, we really value reading the Bible and studying the Bible together and as individuals and and basing our lives and our decisions on the wisdom of God that we find in there. That's something that you hear a lot of churches say. So we think that's really important, but a question that you maybe have never thought about in this way is, why is it so important to study the Bible? I mean, what's the main reason for doing that? Now, obviously, as people of faith, we feel like there's just something unique about Scripture and how it it connects us with the wisdom of God and lets that apply to our lives. But did you know that in Jesus' life, when he was alive and and teaching on earth, he also wanted people to read the Bible? So if if you feel like you should read the Bible, you're in good company there. But he had a very, very specific reason that he wanted people to study Scripture for themselves. Um, And to know what that is, I want to invite you guys to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 5. If you didn't bring a Bible with you this morning, or if you're new to faith and you're not sure how to find individual passages in the Bible, just grab a red one from under the seat in front of you, and you can turn to the page number that's listed on the screen. And now, let me say, I know that many of you already know how to find John chapter 5 in the Bible, and you don't need me to stand up here and tell you what page number to find that on. 
Um, but I also want you to realize that every week we have people with us who are guests or people who just really aren't familiar with the Bible and how it's put together. And it, it's really genuinely helpful to give them some advice and direction on how to get there. And again, because our value is that we want to be biblically based in everything that we do. So it's really important to me, and I think to all of us, that when we gather together on Sunday morning to preach and open up the word, that everyone have an opportunity to look at that with their own eyes. So that's why I say that week after week. It's not to, to tell you guys how to get there. It's because I want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to read this together. And as you're turning there, I just want to tell you something that I have always found to be particularly amazing about the Bible. Um, a lot of you guys know this, some of you may not, but the Bible is not actually a book. If you think about it, the Bible is more like a library, right? It's made up of 66 different books and letters that were collected over the years, and there's some real scope in what's in there. You know, 66 different books written in three different languages by lots of different people on several different continents over the span of about a thousand or more years. And the amazing thing about that is you can pull all these different pieces together, and we believe they all tell one story. They tell the story of God and his loving, active work in this world. And, and that's actually what Jesus is driving at in the text that we're going to look at. So in the passage we're going to look at in John chapter 5, Jesus is in a conversation with this group of people called the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were religious scholars. These were people that took the Hebrew Bible, what we know as the Old Testament, and they had devoted their lives to studying this. Some of these people could quote pretty much the whole Old Testament already, so they knew their stuff. They knew what they were talking about. And Jesus decides to talk to them about why it is important to study the Bible. So go ahead and look at what he says. I think we have verse 38 on the screen, but I think it might actually be in verse 39. It was just a test to see if you were reading the Bible for themselves. It was certainly not a typo that I did. Um, but this is, this is what it says. So Jesus says, You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Okay, listen to that again and just see the claims that he's making about scripture and its importance and what it does. He says, you guys, the Pharisees, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I mean, essentially, I think what he's saying is, hey, you guys, you're doing the right thing. You're getting it half right. You are studying scripture, and you should do that. And you're studying it because you think that in scripture you have the keys to eternal life, and you're right about that. The keys to eternal life, life forever, full, free life, here, right now, those are in scripture. That's the half you're getting right. But you guys are kind of missing the point because you don't see that all the keys to eternal life, that what scripture is really pointing to is me. It's me, right? There is eternal life in Scripture, but only insofar as it points people to me, as it connects people to me, as it helps people understand more about who I am and what it looks like for my power to operate in your life. See, I think that part of the point Jesus is trying to make here is that the Bible, from start to finish, helps us connect with God as he revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. I mean, really what Jesus is saying in this one verse is pretty astounding, he is saying the entire Old Testament is pointing to him. And if you think about it, the whole New Testament is based around him as well. Right? You look at the books in the New Testament and they're either biographies of Jesus or they're a history of what early followers of Jesus did as they tried to follow him or they're letters that were written to young believers to help them know what it looked like to put Jesus' teaching and power into practice in their life. So the entire Bible from start to finish helps us connect with God as he's revealed himself in the person of of Jesus. So it, it, that's what's got to be our end goal. When we read the scriptures for ourselves, when we read the Bible for ourselves, that's what we're driving at. And, and that's a real challenge for somebody like me because I am a to do list person. So what I like to do is get up in the morning and cross that, you know, read the Bible right off my list. I need to read the right number of verses, right number of chapters, check it off so I'm done with that. But that's not the point. The point of reading the Bible is not reading the Bible just to get the verses or chapters under our belt. The point in reading the Bible is to connect with the power of the risen Christ as we encounter him in the text and let that power and that wisdom work its way into our lives. It's not about your to-do list. It's about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. In fact, here's something that I guarantee you are going to hear me say over and over again. Apart from Jesus, everything is in pencil. Okay? 
Apart from Jesus, everything is in pencil. This is what I mean by that. When it comes to the mission that we have as a church, what we are trying to do, we are trying to help people connect with God as he revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is in like bold, permanent marker, sharpie ink right there on the page. You can't erase it. It's not going anywhere. The mission is about Jesus. It will always be about Jesus. But apart from that, everything's in pencil. Right? The, the things that we do to help people connect with God, they may change over time. Right? The ways that we go about doing things, the way we choose to invest time and money to help people get to know him, that may change over the time. That's in pencil, whereas Jesus is in pen. Right? The programs that we do, the kinds of things that we support and partner with to help people know him, plans change. Right? Methods change and strategies change, but the goal doesn't change. Jesus is and always will be in pen. And this is something that is not new to you all because this is something that you all, whether you realize it or not, you have an incredible legacy as a church of having done this. You know, when Martha and I were getting to know Suburban in the interview process, that was really one of the things that drew us to this church is that you have this incredible legacy as a church that has said the God that we follow is always in pen. But the things that we might do to know him and to help other people know him we can change and adjust those over time. Those things are in pencil, but the goal is always in pen. I mean, think about it. Think about the worship service that you're sitting in now. If you've been at Suburban for 10 or 20 or 30 years, you know that the worship services today look different than they looked 30 years ago. Right? They may continue to change. Randy might teach us a new song in a month or two. Right? Or, or think about, as a church, we probably have a lot greater focus on small groups now than we did 20 or 30 years ago. Right? We connect with missionaries very differently now than we did when the church was started because technology has changed. It's easier to have them visit us or to visit them or to communicate them through the web or via Skype. Right? As a church, you have this incredible legacy of saying we are a church that is passionately committed to Jesus. He is in pen, but we are always willing to adapt and change as times and need change. What we do is in pencil, who we follow, and the God we worship is in pen. And we're really excited to have an opportunity to, to continue to build on that this year, to continue to do what you guys have done well for years. We're going to continue focusing on Jesus through studying Scripture because of the way that Scripture helps us connect with him. And again, as a church, this is something that you all have done incredibly well. Like You have this amazing history as a church of people who have wonderful biblical teaching and who gather together in Sunday school classes and in small groups to, to open up God's word and to study that together. And again, for Martha and I in the interview process, that was something that was really compelling about Suburban. It's a real privilege to be able to sort of step into that legacy and continue to help lead in that. So we want to continue to build on that in the coming year. So what's that mean in real practical terms? Right? What does it mean like in terms of preaching and what we do in sermons to be biblically based in all we do? Well, here's how I understand that. Like The goal of us coming together in sermons each week is and always will be to open up the text so that together we encounter the risen Christ and understand more of what it means for his love and wisdom and power to change how we live in the world, how we relate to him and each other in the world around us. That's the goal. It's always going to be the goal. It's always going to be in pen. But the way we do that, the way we interact with Scripture, that might change week to week. Right? We may do a sermon series like you all have done in the past where we decide to preach through a book of the Bible a chapter at a time for however many weeks that takes us. Right? Or some weeks we may start out by reading a long passage of scripture together and just spending the time going back to it and talking about how that applies to our life today. Right? Other weeks we might do what we've done today where we look at one verse. Right? We've only looked at one verse so far today. And really dig in and say, what is it that this verse teaches us? How does this help us connect with the risen Christ? How does this change things for us? Or we may have a week where we look at all sorts of verses from all different parts of the Bible because as we pull them together, we get the full counsel of God's wisdom on a particular topic like money or relationships or marriage or raising kids, whatever that might be. Right, so the way it looks every week, that might change. That might be in pencil. But the goal is never going to change. It's always going to be encountering the power of the risen Christ through his text. That's in pen. And so that's why we're going to continue when we gather together as a group to study scripture together. But because this is such a key value for us, I think one thing you'll also see this year is that we want to continue to encourage and equip you all to read the Bible for yourself. 
you know, there are different groups out there that kind of study church life and how people grow. And, and this is probably not going to be a big surprise to you, but they did this big study a while back. They looked at all sorts of different people, some people who were already Christians, others who weren't, people in very different places on their faith journey. And they looked at all these different things that we can do to know and experience God better, praying, reading the Bible, giving, all these things. And they said what they came up with is that the single most impactful thing that any person can do, wherever they are in their understanding of God, the single most important thing they can do to grow in their understanding of God is to read the Bible for themselves and apply it to their lives. It's to read the Bible and apply it to their lives, right? It's not rocket science, but it's true, which is why we always want to try and help people do that. So if you want to grow, that's a way to do that. And, and I think that this is true whether you would consider yourself a believer or not. Right? We think it's true because we believe that what Jesus says about life and reality are true, and they apply to all of us, wherever we are. So if, if you're here this morning, and you would not consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, I have a, an invitation that I want you to consider doing. Heck, if you're here and you would consider yourself a follower of Jesus, but you don't read the Bible that much, I'd encourage you to do that too. Uh, and that may be a lot of you, because you know, studies have shown that even people who are very committed to God don't read the Bible on a regular basis. So this is what I want you to do. Uh, on your sermon notes down at the bottom, there's a link to a website. It's called YouVersion. And there is a web-based version of this, but more importantly, it's an app that you can download for your phone or any kind of tablet or mobile device that you have. And what you get when you download the YouVersion app is essentially you get hundreds of translations of the Bible in a format that you can carry around wherever you go. This app has been downloaded like 150, 200 million times by people around the world. So you get the Bible, you get God's word to take it with you so you can read it when it's, it fits into your life schedule. But even more important than that, one of the great features of this is that it has all sorts of reading plans that you can search through. And they vary in scope from you know, reading the whole Bible in 90 days to reading a couple verses a day for a week. And a lot of these, these reading plans are, are kind of built around a topic. So if you've never really studied the Bible for yourself, this is what I want to challenge you to do. I want you to think about a topic in your life that's actually something you're working on right now. I mean, maybe your, your marriage or a relationship that you're in is struggling and you're not quite sure what to do to kind of get it moving in the right direction again. Or maybe you're really struggling with your finances or with uh, somebody at work. Or, or maybe there's a particular emotion, anger or fear or anxiety or worry or something that you're wrestling with. Well, I want you to go to version and go to the reading plan thing and type in whatever your issue is and just see the plans that pop up and pick one that looks like it might be helpful to you and commit to reading it. And just commit to seeing what the wisdom of God as revealed in Scripture has to say about the issues you're actually dealing with in your life. And then take a week and try to put it into practice. And just see the difference that that might make for you. Because I think when you see the difference it might make in this area, you might begin to think, wow, I wonder what God might say in this area, and in this area, and in this area. And you may see that, that Jesus' truth is true and works for you, whether you think he's God or whether you think he's just a wise teacher from the past. I, I would just challenge you to do that. I mean, you don't have to believe the Bible's inspired to read it and give it a try. I mean, you really don't have anything to lose. Um, so he, here's the thing, though. I mean, reading the Bible is really important. Reading it personally is important, and we always want to continue to challenge you guys and encourage and equip you to do it. But one of the things that studies have shown is that really there is a lack of Bible reading in the church as a whole. Just a lot of people who are really committed, love Jesus, want to follow him, they just struggle with reading the Bible for themselves on a regular basis. So what I want to do this morning is kind of talk to, to all of us, because we're probably all on that spectrum somewhere, and just try to identify what some of the common challenges are that people face when it comes to reading the Bible for themselves, and see what we can do to deal with that. So the first thing, when I talk to people about reading the Bible themselves, if they're hesitant about doing it, one of the first things that people often tell me is like, hey, I would love to read the Bible for myself, but to be honest, I just don't know where to start. And you know, if that's how you've ever felt before, I get that. Because I mean, look at a Bible. It is a big book. Lots of pages, very small print. Right? So if you don't know much about the Bible, if you've never read it before, it can be really hard to know, where do I get started with this? So that's a legitimate thing to wonder about. I mean, some mornings I get up and, you know, I try to read the Bible first thing in the morning. And after I have some coffee, I think, okay, what do I want to read today? And if I don't have something I'm already reading, I do have a tendency to just kind of feel lost and think, gosh, God, I believe you want to speak to me through the power of your word today, but you got a lot of words in there. <laughs> you know, which ones are you wanting me to read? Well, if that's you, if, if you really struggle with thinking, okay, I just don't know where to start, 
Again, I think a very simple step that you can take is to find a reading plan. They're everywhere. You can go on Uversion and do that. You can Google Bible reading plan. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes for the amount of time you've got, the sort of commitment you want to make. This is a picture of, it might be an older version of the, the search screen for Uversion. But again, just find a plan and, and pick a place to start. Find a plan that, that speaks to your reality right now and just see what it looks like to connect God's wisdom to that. But whatever you do, whatever you do, please, 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 do not just flip open the Bible and stick your finger in and say, I assume that this is what God wants me to hear today. Now, God is powerful, and he may speak to some people that way, but that is not the norm. In fact, when I hear about people who do that, I'm reminded of this story. There was a guy once who got up in the morning. He's like, okay, God, I just, you're all powerful, so I'm going to just flip the Bible open, stick my finger in. Whatever I point to, that is what you want me to do today. That is your will. So he opens up the Bible, and he sticks his finger in, and he reads the verse that says, <laughs> Judas went and hanged himself. So he, of course, says, okay, God, clearly, you know, it's early, I'm waking up, you're waking up, you know, there's some miscommunication here. Let's try this again. So he flips through to another page, sticks his finger in, and reads the verse that says, go and do likewise. <laughs> well, at this point, he's starting to panic, right? Because he thinks, okay, um, God's awake, I'm awake, he's still saying this. Okay, God, third time's the charm, okay? We'll do this one more time. So he takes a deep breath, <sighs> flips through the pages, sticks his finger down, and reads, what you are about to do, go and do quickly. Um, please don't do that, okay? If you don't know where to start, there are wonderful tools to help you find a reasonable place to start. Uh, talk to somebody, get something that gives you advice on what a good first step into the Bible can be for you. Pick a plan and go for it, right? So if you don't know where to start, that doesn't need to be an excuse or a challenge anymore. There are ways to help you start. Uh, another one, though, that I often hear that people say, say, you know, I would read the Bible more for myself, but to be honest, the Bible is really hard to understand. I mean, it was written a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. You no, know, and, and I mentioned that, right? The Bible, some of it was written a thousand years ago in a different language, different part of the world, very different culture. So I think it's perfectly legitimate to look at some parts of the Bible and say, this is really hard to understand, and I think when people read these difficult passages, they just kind of throw up their hand and say, I didn't go to seminary. I'm probably not smart enough to do this. Well, let me tell you something. I went to seminary, and there's still some parts of the Bible that are really hard to understand because they just are. But here's the thing that most people, when they, when they say this, the Bible's really hard to understand. They don't want to fess up to this. It, it all comes back to my mind from a quote that Mark Twain said. Okay, there's a lot of things in the Bible that are hard to understand. But if we're being honest, the vast majority of the Bible is really easy to understand. We just don't want to do it. Right? Mark Twain said this. He said, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand that bother me. Right? There's some challenging things in there to be sure that you need to know more about Bible study methods or history or context to really kind of access and figure out how that can communicate truth to your life today. But an awful lot of the Bible we get. We just don't necessarily want to do it. Like when Jesus says, love your enemies. You don't have to have a degree in Greek to understand that one, right? So there are parts of it that are, are easy to understand, but they're just hard to do. And, and what I want to challenge you to do today, if you think, okay, there are some parts of the Bible that are hard to understand. If, you, if you're reading through a plan or something, if you're reading and you get to a part of the Bible that's hard to understand, you have my permission as your pastor to just skip those parts and move on to something you do understand, and then just decide you're going to come back once you get to the point where it's a little bit better to understand. Well, you've got some, some muscle built up. You've kind of developed some tools for doing that. In fact, I've got a friend who's going to come up here and help me this morning with a little demonstration. Are you, you ready to do this? Why don't you come up, stand right here. I need to grab something real quick, okay? Because in a lot of ways, I, I think reading the Bible is kind of like weight training. Um, so, all right, now some of these people may not know you. So why don't you introduce yourself to people? What's your name? Robert. Okay, guys, this is Robert. And I don't know if you know this, but Robert is incredibly brave because <laughs> he doesn't know what's going on. Now, Robert, question for you. Have you ever done any serious weightlifting before? Because you look, you look pretty swole, I'm just saying. Not really. Not really? Okay, this is what I want you to do. Okay, Robert, this is a 30-pound dumbbell. What I want you to do is pick this up, and I want you to give me 100 bicep curls, Okay. <laughs> Whichever arm you want to do, right or left, it doesn't matter. So can you do that for us? <laughs> We've got time. It, oh, if that's okay, don't, don't hurt yourself. Go ahead and put that back down. There you go. How about this? Now, this is a three-pound dumbbell, okay? You think you could do some, some bicep curls for that? 
Good. One, two, three. It's just 97 more to go. No, I'm just kidding. You don't have to do 100. Why don't you go ahead and put that down for me? And can we give Robert some applause here? Thank you very much. You can go sit, sit back down. Right. Listen, if you have never lifted weights before, it would be really, really dumb to go to the gym and say, you know what? I think I may bench press 400 pounds today. Right? You'd put all the weights on the bar, you would get there, you would fail miserably, and then you would feel dejected, and you would just decide to give up, and you would buy a gallon of cookies and cream ice cream, you would go home and eat it and binge watch Netflix and say, I'm just done with working out, right? No, it would be really, really dumb to try to do that, right? In weightlifting, what you do is you start with what you can do, and you build up to what is harder. You build up to what takes a little bit more training and time and development. And it's exactly the same thing with reading the Bible. Yes, there are some parts that are hard and challenging to understand, but there is a lot that isn't, so start there. So if you're at a part and it's hard, it's difficult to understand for some reason, don't get discouraged. Skip over it and come back to it when you've built up some more muscle. So if you think that the Bible is hard to understand, don't get discouraged about that, but do get started. Get started somewhere. So those are two of the big reasons that I hear from people. You know, it, it don't know where to start. It's hard to understand. But there, there's one last reason I want us to talk about today because I, I do hear this often and I think it's worth addressing. Um, I talk to people and they say, I would love to read the Bible more often. To be quite honest, the Bible is boring. Uh, every time I try to read it, I fall asleep. Well, first off, if you fall asleep when you're reading the Bible, you might want to try reading the Bible at a different time of day. Or you might want to try having some coffee first. I just know that God speaks to me much more clearly after the first cup of coffee than he does before the first cup of coffee. But the, the time of day that you read it aside, I mean, what, what do you do with that idea? The idea that the Bible is boring. Can I let you guys in on a little secret? Just, just lean in, okay? Some parts of the Bible are boring. No, they are. They're, they're very boring. I mean, especially from our 21st century perspective, we look at them and we don't have the history or the cultural context to understand what they say, and they can be incredibly boring to us, right? I mean, think about the Old Testament. There are chapters and chapters and chapters of names that we don't know how to pronounce, and we don't know who any of these people are. And when those things show up in your read through the Bible in your reading plan, you just kind of like, ugh. You know? or, or you think about the book of Leviticus where there's two or three chapters in a row that talk about how you should weave clothing. Or in Numbers, in Numbers, they just count people for a long part of the book. It really is kind of dull. And here's, here's what I want to say about that. This is something I don't think you hear in church very often. While all of Scripture is equally inspired, it's just not equally applicable to our lives. I love the Bible. I want you to hear that really clearly. I love every part of it. I think every part of it is inspired by God, right? 2 Timothy 3 says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and training and all this stuff. Hebrews, Hebrews talks about how the word of God is living and active and it penetrates to the very heart of who we are. So I think God wrote all of it. I think it all comes from him. I think it is all inspired and all tells an incredible part of the story and how we understand who God is and what he calls us to do and how he empowers us to live. But when it comes to the rubber meets the road reality of our lives and our struggles as 21st century Americans, some parts of the Bible are just a lot more practical and applicable than other parts. And it's okay to say that. You're not devaluing the other parts of the Bible by focusing on some. And you guys just know that this is true, right? If you've been in church for a long time, you've experienced this. So if you've been in church for 10 or 15 or 20 years, how many sermons have you heard about the teachings of Jesus Christ? Lots of them, right? How many sermons have you heard about the Old Testament prophet Nahum? Yeah, not as many. And it's not because Nahum's not important. He tells an important part of God's story. But when it comes to how we encounter the risen Christ in the text and let his power change the way we live in our daily decisions, Nahum just doesn't have as much to say about that as Jesus does or as some of Paul's letters do because they address different things. So all of Scripture is equally inspired but it's just not all equally applicable. So if you feel like reading the Bible is boring, my guess is it's because you're reading the wrong parts. And if you're reading the wrong parts, it's because you don't know which ones are the right parts for you right now. And that is where your church can step in. See, in a lot of ways, when I think about the role of the church in the lives of individual Christians, the church is just like Home Depot, right? We are just like Home Depot. You guys know the motto, the slogan of Home Depot? 
Wait, Home Depot says, you can do it. Yeah, we can help. Have you guys been to Home Depot before? <laughs> Big orange sign, it's over on the east side of town. Yeah, so that's their, their slogan, right? You can do the work, we can help. You can fix your house. We're just here to provide the tools, the training, the supplies. That is the role of the church in reading scripture and in so many other things. You can do this. The power of God through the Holy Spirit helps you understand what scripture says. It speaks into our lives. You can do this for yourself and we can help. We can help by by modeling what it looks like to study scripture together when we come in sermons and Bible studies and small groups. We can help by providing plans and tools to overcome some of these obstacles and know where to get started. We can provide help just by encouraging you to do it. You absolutely can do this. It can help you connect with the risen Christ. It can change your life. And we can help. So the one question that I want all of you to think about as we finish up our time together today pretty simple. What do you need to do with what you have heard today? Now again, I know a lot of you have been in church for quite a while. You you probably read the Bible on a regular basis, and it could be easy for you to sit back and say, you know, I I didn't get much out of this. I mean, I already know this. I know it's important. Well, if that's you, I I hope you at least take a few things away with you today. One, I I hope you walk away with a really clear understanding that as a local church, we are 100% committed to this in the coming days. I hope maybe you walk away with an understanding of some of the struggles that other people may have when it comes to engaging the Bible so that you can encourage them and help them engage with Scripture on their own. And I hope it just gives you this reminder that as you do your own reading, that you should be encouraged to do that because as you read, if you have your eyes open to encountering the risen Christ in the text, he will find you there. And he will show you what it looks like to follow him and give you the power to do that. So I hope you're encouraged to keep at it. And if you're here this morning and maybe personal scripture reading is not an important part of your life, I I just hope this will encourage you to figure out what is the next step that you need to take, right? Maybe the next step is just coming back next week for us to open up another passage of scripture together in the sermon, or it's to join a Sunday school class or a small group so that you have the opportunity to, to be shoulder to shoulder with some people and do this work together. Or maybe the next step is just to take the simple step of, of downloading you version, of finding a reading plan and saying, okay, for this week, it may just be a verse a day or a chapter a day. I'm going to do this. Or if you don't know where to start, we really believe that Jesus is important and that as we connect with him, we learn more about God's love and power and presence in our life. So if you don't know where to start, a great place to start is with any of the four biographies of Jesus in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you commit to reading one chapter of one of those a day, you'll finish it in less than a month. So this is not a, a, you know, an insurmountable task that you have to take on. So I just would encourage you, whatever you are, to ask that question, what does it look like to engage with the risen Christ through the Bible? Because this book, right, this Bible, this God that it connects us with, this power to live differently, it is so worth it. And you absolutely can do it. You have been doing it as a church, and we are going to continue to do it in the years to come. You can do it, and we can help. Let's keep that in mind as we pray. God, thank you. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to come together today. I mean, I never get tired of this, Lord. It's pretty amazing that these words that were written down a long time ago in a different language, in a different culture that seems very foreign to us, Yet somehow, Lord, you still speak to every single person today who has ears to listen. You can talk right into the real reality of our lives and our world through this text that was written so long ago. That is an amazing thing that you do through the power of your spirit. So God, thank you. I want to thank you for the years that this church has faithfully followed the Jesus written in pen in the midst of times that have changed and strategies that have changed and programs that have changed. Thank you, God, for their commitment to keep everything else in pencil as long as you and your mission and your heart are squarely written in pen and we keep that front and center. Thank you, God, for the people who are here today that are going to take a step this week to connect with you through your word, whether that's through a formal reading plan or just picking it up and reading starting in one of the gospels. God, I just pray that you would help each person know what single step they can take today to begin to know more about you, to know more about your plan for their life, and to know more about the power and grace that is available to them. We are so grateful, Lord, that you still speak today. 
We are so grateful that today, more than anyone in human history, we have ready access to your word. Carry it with us wherever we go. God, help us not take that for granted, but instead help us connect with you through your word in ways that changes how we live in this world. Amen. Thank you guys for your time and for being here this week. We look forward to seeing you again next week as we continue looking ahead to the coming year at some of the lenses that will be important to us. Hope you guys have a fantastic week.